Good evening. President Nurse, the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize Selection Committee, Dr. Bargman and awardees, Dr. Gail Martin, Dr. Beatrice Mintz, and Dr. Elizabeth Robertson, and distinguished guests. I'm honored and delighted to be here. Thank you, Dr. Nurse, for the kind introduction and for your gracious welcome to the Rockefeller University. I'm deeply honored to have been selected as a presenter of the Pearl Meister Green Guard Award presentation and to be part of the recognition of these three women biomedical scientists, Drs. Gail Martin, Beatrice Mintz, and Elizabeth Robertson, on this award of their great groundbreaking work. I warmly congratulate them. Finally, I would like to commend Ursula von Reidingsvard and Paul Greengard for establishing this prize. As an archaeologist, I'm also delighted to share some of my observations about my profession. In the 18th and 19th century, archaeology was essentially a treasure hunt. Wealthy Europeans went to the Mediterranean and the Middle East to collect museum pieces and send them back home. In 1784, the Comte de Choisy Gouffier wrote to his agent in Athens, take everything you can. Do not neglect any opportunity for looting all that is lootable in Athens. Spare neither the living nor the dead. <laughs> 17 years later, in 1801, the Turkish government gave Lord Elgin permission to remove the sculptures from the Athenian Acropolis and ship them to England. In the second half of the 19th century, archaeology began to change from the search for treasure to the systematic excavation and study of artifacts. Among these researchers were a number of extraordinary women who may be seen as the predecessors of the first generation of women archaeologists. For those who are, of you who are not familiar with my book, Breaking Ground, Pioneering Women Archaeologists, published by the University of Michigan Press, it tells the stories of 12 intrepid women. All of them have a Western bent and all made contributions to Mediterranean and Near Eastern archaeology. The first generation was born from 1850 to 1890 and includes Jane de la Foy, a French archaeologist working in then Persia, modern-day Iran, at the Palace of Xerxes at Susa and at Persepolis. Esther Van Diemen, the first American archaeologist in Italy, specializing in Roman construction techniques. Margaret Alice Murray, British Egyptologist, who prepared two generations of Egyptologists at University College London. She was so poor that her students took up a collection to purchase her academic regalia. Gertrude Bell, a British legend involved in Middle Eastern politics who founded the Iraqi Department of Antiquities. Bell was the advisor of kings, an ally of Lawrence of Arabia. Perhaps some of you may have read Desert Queen. Harriet Boyd Hawes, an American archaeologist who discovered the pre-palace site of Gornia in Crete. Edith Hall Dohan, an American pioneer who also worked in Greece and Crete. Hetty Goldman, the first American woman, woman to direct excavations on mainland Greece and in Turkey. Gertrude Caton Thompson, an American prehistorian working on the Nile in the Karga Oasis and in Zimbabwe. She is also the first archaeologist to conduct a scientific excavation in Arabia. With patriotic zeal, many of these pioneers also laboriously worked for the First World War effort. The second generation was born between 1890 and 1910 and includes Dorothy Garrod, Disney professor at Cambridge University. Garrod was the first woman to hold a chair from 1939 to 1952. She was a fa famous Palestinian archaeologist and worked in Lebanon and on Mount Carmel in Israel. Winifred Lamb, another English woman who was involved in Greece and worked at Mycenae, at Sparta, and Macedonia. 
She directed her own excavations at Thermi on the island of Lesbos and published extensively on Greek and Roman bronzes. We have to remember that until 1920, women were not admitted as residents of the British school in Athens, and women who studied at Cambridge could not receive a college degree. Winifred Lamb was awarded hers in 1925, well after the fact. Teresa Goel was an American and the first to use geophysical techniques while she directed her excavations at Nimrud Dag in eastern Turkey. And finally, Kathleen Kenyon, who was a pioneer and doyen of Palestinian archaeology working in Jericho and Jerusalem. Most of these women participated in intelligence efforts of World War II. Breaking Ground may as well have been entitled Against All Odds, as the women archaeologists whose lives and careers faced innumerable challenges and difficulties, but prevailed to contribute significantly to the expansion of our knowledge of the ancient world. Just like those who are celebrated this evening, most entered this male-dominated field at a time when few educational opportunities or careers were open to women. These pioneers in countries where traditional patriarchal societies did not generally allow women leadership or even public roles. I found women traveling alone through deserts and mountains and gaining acceptance from Bedouin tribes. I found them directing field work using male workers whose own wives held subservient roles. The women archaeologists' rewards were mo almost purely intellectual. Many received no or almost no compensation for their demanding jobs, but of adventure there was plenty. Like scientists, doctors Martin, Mintz, and Robertson, their activities were arduous, often dangerous, and required determination, stamina, a love of adventure, and certainly dedication. The stories are all very different. Most had to make their way alone through the minefields of family, when normally of girls of similar backgrounds were preoccupied with just getting by. And if they were lucky, they may have enjoyed dancing lessons, and if they were of adventurous bent, camping. <clears throat> All these wanderer archaeologists were wholly unprepared for the tribulations that would face them. They came from families in which the offspring had to fend for themselves. Most of them had autocratic and demanding fathers, and most had neither money nor useful contacts in foreign lands. Most mastered the languages that were a vital help, and they became familiar with alien customs and ways of life. They had to know whom to trust, and how to avoid danger. There was no safety net for them. It was a question of swimming, which no one had taught them, or drowning. Whenever they took part in excavation expeditions, they all faced the same deprivations of poor housing, primitive hygiene, limited food, and long hours and severe weather, sorting or washing pottery, drawing plans, keeping records, and enduring sandstorms, searing temperatures, or heavy rains. The strange and sometimes bizarre journeys they undertook during their lives help us work out our own thoughts about events that touch us. How to explain the small number of success stories among this group of women? I don't think that they were more gifted than those who came before or after, or there were more saints or geniuses among them. It was simply that they faced much greater challenges. First, to survive the social realities of their day, and later, later to make their way in the unfamiliar world of academia. And the price of failure was infinitely higher. Often there was no second chance. But I can never forget that accident often played a decisive role even in their lives. The role of accident was often crucial. With regard to success or failure, it was simply a question of being in the right place at the right time. These were the lucky ones, for eventually possibilities and careers opened to them. What they had in common with our awardees this evening is the straightforward determination to use their talents and rise to the occasion. It is good to be reminded now how hard it was, and still is, for a woman to fulfill her abilities. 
They followed Ralph Waldo Emerson's rubric, always do what you are afraid to do. Archaeology and science are not glamorous, but they are adventurous and filled with the unexpected. Such a life makes more demands on the female sex, and it takes a certain type of woman to persist and succeed. At this juncture, I feel that my own perceptions of my career may be useful to reflect upon. The difficulties <coughs> pardon me, that I, as a fifth generation woman, are almost as challenging as those encountered by my predecessors in earlier years. Believe me, the field is not neutral and level ground has not been reached. We women have to perform more brilliantly than men at the same intellectual level, and we have the same intellectual bent and brain power as men. Professionalism carries with it preconceived need to cultivate and maintain a level of status. Even with affirmative action, gender constraints still exist, and we must appreciate the challenges women face in order to be in the field at all and to be heard. Women still face discrimination. Until the mid-70s, there was the erasure of women from the scholarly apparatus that formed the history of the archaeological profession. I had to battle the male establishment every step of the way. Having learned so much of the work I had done in my first 20 years of excavation was ascribed to the men I was working with, I felt exploited. And of course, as women, we cannot allow ourselves high emotion or drama. Whatever our thoughts are or were, we can't allow ourselves to be impelled toward political radicalism either. The tone in my academic department was so hostile and threatening that I perceived that I had to go out on my own. I was made to feel the pressure to avoid the appointment of a woman in the department chair's position, but I became chair in my own right. I made a few strides in the causes of the department with the administration, even though I was a woman. Field work in academia in general depends so much on the male-oriented academy's support. Although I have been in the field for 40 years, it is only in the last 15 years that I've been the sole director of the excavation of the Petrograd Temple in Jordan. Now that I'm retired, I've become self-reflexive. Others and I march along a continuum towards real parity of opportunity and acknowledgement. But the neoconservative days of North America are still with us. Yes, I have a layer of subjectivity, a psychological situation and a personal vision that there still is a glass ceiling and it's time for a real change in academia. By celebrating the careers of these intelligent and dedicated women, we not only honor Drs. Martin, Mintz, and Robertson, but we also hope to encourage other women to be drawn to scientific research or archaeology as a career so that the human record may continue to be pieced together in the years ahead. And the connection between your work, awardees, and my own might be that you research early cellular development while my research is on the development of early civilization. All of us are trying to figure out how all the building blocks fit together. But we are honored, we are here to honor and celebrate your distinguished achievements as women in biomedical science. You have made a difference. In conclusion, as I look back on these pioneering women, my own career, and your careers, I am proud of being an archaeologist, I'm proud of being a woman, and I'm grateful to my family, particularly my husband of 51 years, for all the support and love I have enjoyed. And finally, I am honored to be here and part of the Rockefeller University's salute to women scientists. I warmly congratulate Drs. Martin, Mintz, and Robertson on this recognition of their groundbreaking work. And I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this evening. Congratulations to all. Thank you.